I express, I'm sure, your feelings when I say that we have been delighted with the excellent music <coughs> that have, has been rendered during the sessions of this conference. This Nebo State Choir is made up very largely of ward choirs of that state. The church music committee with whom I happen to be associated is extremely anxious that we shall build up in every ward a ward choir. These can be combined for state conference music or even for our general conference music as we've had it here today. Tomorrow night in the tabernacle, a demonstration of what 60 ward choirs can do making some 1,500 singers have been trained now for several weeks under Brother Cornwall's direction and others associated with him are going to show you what can be achieved by a group of ward choirs. We earnestly hope that all of you who are interested will come and get the inspiration of this, I think, the finest demonstration of a group of that size that has ever been presented in this building. The church <coughs> has a definite mission and responsibility and how excellent it is that we come together every six months and in our stakes every three months to keep our eyes upon that mission. Sometimes in my missionary work, people have asked, why do you send missionaries to this town? We're all Christians here. Why do you not go to the pagan nations. Our mission is to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people, no matter what their faith or nationality. Our mission is unique. We recognize no competitors, and yet we recognize men doing good in all churches, insomuch as they teach men to honor Christ to believe in God and attempt to live up to some at least of the teachings of the Master. May I help you to <coughs> keep in mind this by calling your attention to the ministry of the Master himself, who undertook to teach men to step forward to a higher level. That beautiful Sermon upon the Mount, how in contrast it was to the Mosaic Law that allowed an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. There were not many who could endure that teaching, however, and as they turned away from him, he turned to his disciples and asked if they would go also. They, but they answered, <coughs> Whither shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. There was no other place. Difficult as it was, they were determined to stay. And then one of the disciples said, Master, if men have to live up to these teachings, are there then to be only a few who shall be saved? And he answered, Straight is the gate and narrow the way that leadeth to life, life in the presence of God, life in the celestial kingdom, life in the highest place provided for the sons and daughters of our Father, and few there be that find it, while broad is the gate, and wide is the way that leadeth to death, meaning loss of that exaltation, and many there be who go in thereat. Our declaration <coughs> to all men is that we know the straight gate and the narrow way, not from our knowledge, but from the revelations of God, from those who knew it, who have visited the earth and have revealed to man again in this age the way through that straight gate and narrow way and the divine authority to administer the sacred ordinances of the gospel to put men's feet in that path that shall lead to exaltation in the celestial kingdom. <clears throat> We've gathered together these hosts of people who have enlisted, and we're inviting men and women everywhere to enlist. 
to subscribe to the highest standard I've ever undertaken in the history of this world to subscribe to. This peculiar people are peculiar because they've been able to reach a higher standard of living set forth by the master. There isn't an item he gave to man that is not incorporated in this church and in the revelations of God to this generation. What Peter said to the baptized believers that they should add to their faith virtue and to virtue knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness and charity, we have in the third, fourth section of the book of Doctrine and Covenants and there's added humility and diligence. The prophet said in the Articles of Faith, we believe in being honest, true, chaste, benevolent, virtuous and in doing good to all men. I say these standards are the highest that have been <coughs> undertaken by any generation to subscribe to. <coughs> Our ceremonies and ordinances are important, yes, but it's only the initiation. The great effort is to bring poor, weak human nature to adhere to these standards of living, being honest. Honest with each other, yes. <clears throat> One of the characteristics of this church has been that we have the reputation of being honest. I shall never forget the thrill that came to me 43 years ago when in the northern states at the close of a open-air meeting, an elderly gentleman had driven up in a carriage with his high silk hat and listened and then asked if he could speak. He said to the people of South Bend, I want you to be kind to these Mormon elders because their people are my friends. I've been doing business with them for many years. I have never lost a dollar on a Mormon and I cannot say that of any other community in the United States, good as it bond. That was Mr. Studebaker, one of the brothers of that great institution. I want the Latter-day Saints to know that their reputation for honesty, honesty towards each other, is expected to be maintained by our Father in Heaven, that we may distinguish ourselves. Honesty to the Lord, there's where honesty really begins, in the payment of our tithes and offerings. This record we heard yesterday thrilled us all because of the honesty and the integrity of many of our people. If we have failed, there's always the chance to repent and get into the path again and undertake to conquer and to master and to overcome the weaknesses of the flesh, for there is power in this gospel to enable the weakest of the weak to attain unto this perfect state of living. So far as mortality is concerned, we do not expect to reach perfection, but we can live up to these standards. There may be some of us who may feel like those of old. What profit is it that we've paid our tithes and offerings? We see the wicked flourish like a green bay tree, but the Lord comforted them with the assurance that not all his blessings were material, that a record, a faithful record, was being kept of the acts and the labors of men and when... I come to make up my jewels, then shall the books be opened, then shall you know when you return to the earth whether it has been profitable to serve God. For the man that pays his honest tithing is paying his rent to the Almighty, who is the proprietor of this earth, and if he expects an eternal inheritance upon it, he must obey the law of inheritance. Has it been profitable to the Latter-day Saints that they have paid their tithes and offerings and sent their sons and daughters on missions? The record shows that not only spiritual blessings but even material blessings have come and those windows of heaven have been opened and blessings have been poured out upon the heads of the Latter-day Saints. When we took our survey of the membership of the church that was on relief, it was not a surprise to me to find 
85% of the entire non-tithe payers. The Lord had somehow or other taken care of those who had paid their tithing. There have been some that have felt that it was impossible for Latter-day Saints to pay their tithing and then send their sons on mission and meet their other missions and meet their other obligations. But our own survey reveals the fact that those who are meeting their obligations are the tithe payers. And those who are sending their sons on missions are tithe payers. And they have not suffered financial loss because of this great contribution. I have before me a survey of 20,000 living returned missionaries. What a glory, glorious thing it is to discover some 85% of them faithful and paying their tithing and some 87% of them in employment. The Lord has fulfilled his promise. I confess that it drains such as all this on any other people without the favor and the blessing of the Almighty would have bankrupt them, but it has not depleted us. And those who are most prosperous and who are blessed in their material affairs are those who have served the Lord in this respect. I once was asked by a banker if I thought the time would ever come when the treasures such as gold and silver and securities might be preserved without putting them in banks and locking them up and then electrifying the vaults. Yes, I said, someday, not on this earth, someday there shall be separated into their own group those men that are so honest that they could walk within hand's reach of that which is not theirs and nothing prevent them save the rectitude of their own intentions. They die before they take that which does not belong to them. And when they have subscribed to all the other requirements, they shall find themselves in the celestial kingdom whose streets will be paved with gold and whose walls will be set with diamonds and jasper and there'll be no fear of these values being interfered with, for they are honest to walk there. There are two principles as certain and as true as that the sun shines. Like has ever and shall ever be attracting to like. And as we sow, so shall we reap. <clears throat> one, pro one poet has expressed it, that to every man there openeth a way and ways and a way. And the high soul climbs the highway, while the low soul gropes the low. And in between on the misty flats, the rest drift to and fro. But to every man there openeth a highway and a low. And every soul decideth the way his soul shall go. We are free, but we're inviting every man to climb the highway. We know the way. And that way will lead through the straight gate to the presence of God Almighty in the celestial kingdom. That's the mission of this church. <clears throat> yes, the man that's laboring to create faith in the hearts of the children of men and the Redeemer of the world are doing good and we bless them for it, but they're not engaged in the kind of work we're engaged in. For our fathers, sons, and daughters, the masses of them will find ultimately through their obedience their salvation in some of our fathers' other kingdoms, but that's not the work that we're concerned with. It is written in our own revelations that only those that can abide the celestial Law can endure celestial glory. Yes, as we sow, so shall we reap. We're reaping now, here on the earth, blessed and fortunate as we are, the sons of Joseph, the descendants of Israel. We are reaping the consequence of our righteousness before ever we live on this earth. And just as Brother George F. Richards has indicated that the poor and benighted Negro brethren are suffering the consequence of their sowing some other time and place. So as certainly shall we hereafter reap what we are sowing here and now. Those are eternal principles. And every man and woman, no matter what their nationality may be, who can subscribe to these standards, 
and add unto their faith virtue, keep themselves above temptation, and full of the spirit of charity and self-mastery in that they are controllers of their own appetites and otherwise can subscribe to these highest standards of living given to us by the Master in preparation for eternal living in His presence, we'll pass to that company of glorified men and women as certain as the sun shines. That's the mission of this church, to prepare men and women for eternal living in that glorified presence. And the light of it and the power of it is being seen on earth. There's more power in this church today <clears throat> to control the world and its destinies than in all the armies and all the guns and all the military provision that is being made. For nations may be subdued by the might and power of arms only to rebel. There's only one way by which the nations can be brought into unity and into peace and into brotherhood, and it is not through guns nor might nor force, but through the power of God and the love of our fellow men that is in the hearts of this people. This great demonstration of bringing these hosts of people together from all nations here and living in love and brotherhood is a demonstration the like of which has never been shown in the history of this world. God bless the great and glorious cause of Zion and that we may keep our eye upon the great destiny of this work and its mission for our redemption, for our preparation for exaltation with the glorified and to become the hope, the light of the world, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I am very